For the business, this is what I do for the business. And we were respectful in that way. And so him and I were talking during that tour. And it, so it was me, him, and Kyle. And we had kind of a hired gun guitarist screamer, Michael LaBelle. And then a and then a hired gun drummer, Brandon. And uh, it was decided that we weren't going to continue with Brandon while it was on that tour. It had been kind of festering. It was like, okay, nobody really wants to work with him anymore. So we're going to sever ties, but we don't know what we're going to do about it really afterwards. So we all agreed, well, like, why don't we just kind of chill out? Let's write music. You know, I was expecting a kid. So I was like, you know, I'm going to get a job so that we can, you know, so that I can be prepared and, you know, be responsible on that end. And let's write our next album in the meantime and then get prepared and then regroup. And, um, and then, that kind of kickstarted lots of inner turmoil of as soon as as soon as Kyle's dad kind of came to terms with okay yes I stole all this money and you know he was strong armed with a letter from a lawyer and everything and then we and then we settled I mean I still don't know how much he actually took mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if anybody actually knows but 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 there was a settlement made which also I wasn't privy to that. that. That was all between Nick and Nick's mom settled something with him. And then we were all told about it. Um, and so there was a settlement and then Nick and I essentially what really kicks like turned everything into a tailspin was that him and I disagreed on how to handle the settlement. Um, like both him and I said, okay, like you and I, you know, I get the settlement. Like we're the current active members of the band. So the settlement, you know, like, like we're like, it's ours. And I was like, okay, so then why don't we just pay ourselves out? And uh, him and his mom felt, well, we should pay you all like employees, you know, like we'll like kind of pay you almost like paychecks. And I was like, that's cool if Nick wants to do that, but you just got done telling me that we're agreeing that we're going to split the settlement. So I, I would like mine and I'll handle my taxes. You don't have to worry about it. I'll handle my own taxes. And that kind of, and then they were taking control of it. So they were saying, well, no, 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 no. We're like, we're going to do it this way. Cause it'll look better. And I was like, well, I don't, I don't really care. <laughs> I mean, like you just said that you're taking half and I'm taking half. So like, you can do it that way. That's fine. Like, I'm not telling you how to do yours. And that's what kind of took everything into this outer realm of, I woke up one day and I was booted from the Facebook page. And uh, cause a lot of people think, you know, like, you know, I'm because I know that the question was going to come up about the Facebook page. Um, but technically, I was the first person removed from the Facebook page. So I got kicked out years back and I and I gained control back with legal proof um, with, you know, trademark ownership. And uh, so I got the page back. Um, but I was kicked off the page and then a post was made um, about an, an amicable split, which was not amicable we never had a conversation about us stopping mm -hmm. you know i mean like nick and i argued all the time i mean like him and i always butt heads but i always felt that we had a business relationship of you know what we're gonna disagree from time to time so we're gonna piss each other off we're gonna disrespect each other but we're gonna come back and we're gonna be cool and we're gonna do what's best for the business um but this was what i guess on his end pushed it past the realm of being able to come back because we didn't have a strong foundation nick and i from day one, didn't really get along all that well. Um, like when I first joined the band, he was quote unquote the bully. I mean, Corey and I had sit down conversations about it kind of all the time. He was like, it's weird ever since you joined, he stopped doing it to me and now he does it to you. Um, <laughs> but he was kind of, he was kind of that role. And like the other guys were just kind of like, you know, just kind of rolled with the punches, just having fun. And Kyle was the only one that I ever saw as kind of like taking the business side somewhat seriously. And I was always very serious about it. Um, you know, it, like I think it was in one of your interviews with Jordan, he mentioned uh, coming into a green room and I was trying to warm up and they were smoking weed. And he was like, yeah, he was kind of annoyed. I was like, yeah, I probably was. I mean, I'm, I, I have extreme allergies. And, uh, and if I only have one green room to warm up in, I'll probably say, hey, can you guys please go smoke somewhere else so I can warm up and actually perform? Makes sense. Um, 
Yeah, so I mean, so, so I mean, I heard that. I was like, yeah, that's that was probably true because I know the dance Gavin dance guys smoke a lot of weed. I've toured with them at least four or five times. Um, all great guys. I have no problems with anybody. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that there was always this huge disconnect on where I was at in how far I was willing to go to to you know succeed with a group with guys who, I mean for lack of better words, like they were all still living at home and, you know, like they had a good thing going for them. Like I'll always give them that. Like it was like, yeah, there was a good thing going, but, but I was always concerned about the follow through Mm. of, okay, like what do you do after the wave crashes? Like that's when you have to be able to like, are you going to put the work in and are you going to keep fighting for it? And that's what I was always pushing towards, which I think always kind of separated me because I was always you know, it was a business to me. I was very serious about it and I was very passionate. I mean, I completely left, I was living in Southern California and moved to Northern California to do it. And there was other bands I was auditioning for who lived in Florida and Ohio, and I was ready to just up and go Mm -hmm. because that's what I wanted. Um, But I ended up joining them and I was very passionate about it. And I think that was honestly part of like the distress between me and some of them was that I took it very seriously and it was, and it was fun for some of them. I mean, even I think Brian said something to the to the degree of uh, that he didn't take it very seriously, and that he realizes it now, and that and that he didn't realize how serious it was. Mm-hmm. Where it's like that's what I was trying to say. <laughs> like I was always like, this is serious. Like I was, like, this is a real opportunity, and uh, and it kind of caused a big wedge between because I was the wedge between fun and you know what I thought would be more fun because it was like, well, isn't more success more fun? Right. And like, let's, you know, like find the fine line between having fun and, and, you know, moving forward instead of just staying in one spot. That's where my head was always at. Are, are you still somewhat close to either Corey or Brian? I understand what you just said about the rest of the guys, especially Nick and especially Kyle, but do you keep in contact with Brian or Corey at all or even Joey? Honestly, no. I mean, see, this is the weird thing is that the only person that I ever actually considered a friend within the band was actually Joey. Um, Like he was ever since I joined the band, he was the easiest to get along with. Anytime I had family come out, I was like, hey, if you ever feel uncomfortable, just go talk to him. Like he'll he'll make you feel comfortable. Um, He was the only person I ever hung out with off tour. And like nobody hung out off tour. Nobody. It was really, it was really strange to me. Like we would get home from tour, and for the first year, year and a half, I lived with Kyle and his parents, and it was the weirdest thing to me that nobody did anything together. Mm-hmm. Um, but Joey would like, you know, text me to hang out and stuff. So I'd go where we play video games and just like shoot the shit and go get burritos and, you know, do what friends do. Right. And uh, so him and I had that for a little bit until he, until he was out of the band. Then at that point, I had already moved from Northern California, so him and I had kind of, you know, separated, but not really on bad terms. I mean, the way that I look at a lot of the stuff of, of now is I completely understand why somebody might support someone where they don't even really know what's going on. And it's the it's a small town it's a small town mentality. Mm-hmm. Somebody lives up the road from you, you don't want to stir the leaves with them. You know, it's like, ah, yeah, they're probably right. I don't want to cause drama with them because they're they're still in my town but this person who doesn't live there anymore you know like okay i'll i'll back you up against them even though i don't really know the whole story you know i've got lots of i mean i grew up in a small town i grew up in a small town in wyoming so i know how the whole small town mentality goes um which is one thing i always gave credit to brian for because brian lived in san diego for a while and he kind of always just kept out of it he just and I was like, well, I mean, he doesn't know what's going on, just like the rest of them. I mean, so then why would anybody pipe in? They don't They don't know. I mean, the only people who really know is Nick and I. Those are the only people who actually know. Right. Um, and I always gave him the utmost credit silently. I mean, I didn't – I mean, this is me publicly saying I gave him the utmost credit for not saying anything when it's unnecessary. Because it's like, I mean, unless it's coming from the source, you know, like, what do you really know? And if you cared so much, why'd you leave the band? I mean, like, why were you like, you know, like, why didn't you support anything the band was doing once you left the band? Well, why did it only matter when drama came in? Right. What? Uh, I think I forgot what I was going to ask just then. I had a thought and then 
Somebody said something about your dog snoring, and I was about to like answer it, and then it threw me off my question. Um, Mac, do you we have another question? Like a, we should put up like a some kind of like a picture. <laughs> like he doesn't have a breathing problem. Yes, there's a dog <laughs> in the background. I'd put him outside, but he he likes to bark at random things, and he'd just be barking like crazy. No, it's all good. Mac, do you have another question for for Jack? Yeah. Um, do you have a song that you do vocally that may be more difficult than the others? I mean, it's been a while since I've done anything live, but Air the Enlightenment. Air the Enlightenment to me is like the highest note I ever heard you hit. Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure Air the Enlightenment was all falsetto though. So I I, I think that was softer. Oh no, I know, I know what you're talking the, about now. Because I don't think that part. That, yeah. I don't think we ever played that one live. Um, I mean, like there were certain songs that I would definitely, I was mindful about like, Hey, like this song should be earlier in the set. Cause if I'm, if, if we're playing like 12 songs, I don't want this one going last. Um, I mean, too little, too late was, uh, was always, you know, even though I think it was our best song, that one, that one was up there trying to think we only ever played pursuit. Let's let's wisdom ride the wind like twice live. Um, but that one I know has a note in there. I mean, even some of the signal stuff. I mean, I, I you know, tried to push myself just because for a while there, I kind of like forgot how to sing. Like touring and uh, I feel like every record, it was more and more like, we'll do this more gritty. Don't do so much of that. Like don't sing so high. And, and like me, I naturally go towards more, you know, higher ranges. That's just kind of where my where my passion goes. And uh, so I almost had to kind of like retrain myself on how I wanted to sing. And it's almost like that year plus period of time where I didn't do music. I had to like even just driving in the car, I had to kind of retrain like the muscles in my in my throat, like where to sing from and where not to sing from. Uh, Because even some of the last few vocal coaches I saw, like when we were doing Rise, he was like, you have a really interesting style to you. He was like, it sounds very damaging what you're doing. And he was like, but you sound controlled in it. But he was like, but it sounds uncomfortable. And I was like, yeah, yeah, it is uncomfortable. And he was like, but it sounds like you at least know what you're doing with it, whatever it is. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, every record was kind of like this discovery phase. Like, I feel like Wires and Adelphia, I was... uh, like very much just doing my thing. And then as soon as we hit identity, I think identity, a lot of identity was just very stressful. Like identity was probably the hardest record for me to make. That one was almost my breaking point. Um, Like, I'm not sure. I think I've said it in past interviews, but there's the song 500 days of bummer. Mm -hmm. That's actually about writing that record. Um, (laughs) um, It was just a very hard record to make. It was not enjoyable. It was very stressful. Um, that was probably like my darkest point in the band was identity on fire. Even though I couldn't hear it. Bless you. (laughs) Thank you. Um, And then, and then oddly in between identity and rise is where I started getting into fitness, which is where Nick had already been into it. And then all of a sudden him and I had this connection, like Mm. him and I had something that we could agree on, like something that we could connect on. And so then that, bridged you know him and i at least finding some kind of bond and so then that's where him and i kind of really took over like writing like really him and i wrote rise for the most part and then him and i 100 percent wrote the self-titled record um so but it was rise is when him and i kind of took on a completely different dynamic of you know not making it such a stressful scenario because writing was always like you throw all of us in a room and see what happens mm-hmm. where it was like, well, we need a vision. Like let's get a vision and let's make it fluent. Cause I think I personally think rise is the most fluent record we put out. I think that it from start to finish, I think it makes the most sense from start to finish. Is it my favorite one? No, but I think it makes the most sense from start to finish. Whereas other records, some songs I'm like, what, like, what is this? You know, <laughs> I'm like, sure. Like this was fun. Like we kind of went out on a limb, but I feel like we started to, get our footing into how him and I work together. Um, it's funny. It almost makes me think like, I've always been a, a huge kiss fan and um, oh, yeah. like, uh, like Paul Stanley and Gene Simmons are, have a, an understanding of each other. I mean, Gene didn't even go to Paul's wedding because Gene doesn't believe in weddings, but they have this professional respect for one another. 
Like they've disagreed with each other to the end, but they've always stuck to this is what's best for the business. Let's work together. We're business partners. We might not be best friends, but we're good business partners. We work well together when it comes to business. Gotcha. And, and, and I felt like there was a period of time that Nick and I had that. And uh, the whole settling of the embezzlement is what really kind of pushed things in this sour direction, which yeah. is unfortunate. There's... I mean, it's something that I... I mean, it's something that I didn't see coming. I posted a video as soon as I saw the Facebook post on there that I wasn't included in um, of me no longer being in the band, but it being amicable. Um, you know, I was, I was pretty frustrated by it. And that's what kind of tails that started everything. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a fan question coming in. But before I ask that earlier, you said that you had considered a band in Florida before you picked Skylet as well as another band. I'm wondering if you recall the names of the bands that you almost joined. I do. So, well, one of them never wrote me back, but I was prepared. The one that I actually went, I tried out for, I sang with them, I even wrote vocals for one of their songs that they actually took the bulk of my melodies was Versa Emerge. Wow, Versa Emerge, I remember them. So that was, this is pre uh, Sierra. Was Sierra was her so, name? So, so then it's funny because Sierra actually wrote me on AIM. <laughs> she got it from Blake, their, their guitar. She got my screen name, and she was like, "Hey." Well, this was after like I had joined a Skylight Drive and she had been announced as their singer and she was working on stuff and she was like, Hey, so like we really like what you did on this song. Like, would you mind if I kind of like took some of your ideas? And I I blatantly like I was all like, Yeah, just make sure I can't tell. Okay. And I and I could tell. Gotcha. <laughs> I mean, I was like, Really? I mean, like you took my entire chorus melody that I could have used on a different song and uh, like you changed the words, but I was like, Oh, well, that sucks. But that was the band that I was probably the closest to joining. And then um, uh, Hit the Lights was also looking for a singer. Wow. And Dance Gavin Dance, for that matter. So I actually wrote Dance Gavin Dance as well, but I didn't hear back from either of those two. So it was Versa Emerge and a Skylight Drive. Cool. The question uh, that's coming in from the fans is, is something you kind of briefly touched on earlier regarding advice for younger bands. But the question specifically says, since you take, uh, take it so serious as a business, what piece of advice would you give to up and coming bands trying to take it serious question mark oh man it's so hard because i'm coming from it i mean you know i've got two daughters and so my whole stance of it is it's like well i mean the be responsible yeah I, I mean like at the end of the day like what makes you money is touring and merch sales it's you it's impossible to rest on record sales anymore so it's like you have to sacrifice so much else so it's like either be all in or don't be in it or don't be in. I mean, either be willing to lose a lot at home, you know, be alone. <laughs> I mean, you got to be willing to give all that up to have a chance. I mean, and if you're not willing to, that doesn't mean that you don't deserve it. It just means, you know, I mean, you have less chances um, and find a good team. I mean, a good team is so important because, you know, again, again, there's so many bands, bands. Like I remember back in the, you know, back in the Skylight days, there was this band Conditions. So good. And like, every band that ever toured that we ever toured was like, oh, my God, Conditions is so good. And like their record was so good. Um, but it just never happened. I mean, it, it, it just didn't click. And I remember, oddly, Pierce the Veil was one of those bands, bands. But then what worked for them was that everybody liked them. So everybody took them on tour and then they got exposure after exposure. And I was like, good for them, you know, mm. like, cause, cause they were always a band's band. Cause they were always a little more, you know, eclectic, more of a, of an acquired taste, like on their earlier records. And, uh, but bands appreciated it, you know, kind of like closure in Moscow, you know, like some of these like very talented musicians who are just so good together. But for some reason you, you were like, why don't these guys blow up? Um, but it happened for Pierce the Veil, and I was and, and I was glad to see that happen because I was like, there it is, you know, like a band who doesn't fit any mold. They did it right. They were good people, and people enjoyed being around them, so they took them on their tours, and then people saw them for what they were. With like they had the most organic, like the most organic growth I've ever seen, probably in our scene was them. Basically, now being in 2022, almost any band could be, could virtually be successful by doing it themselves if they do it correct would you would you say it's it's an easier route or more likely for a band to go through is it worth signing to a label anymore i guess is what i'm trying to ask is it worth signing to a label or, or would you say 
you can do it if you just have the right team independently. Like which, which advice would you give on that direction? There's, there's kind of a yes or no. I mean, labels are so different nowadays. Like back when we started, like things like the names like Rise Records and Fearless Records like meant something. You know, like people paid attention if you were one of those bands. I don't think it's the same anymore. Now is it's like, how many views did you get on TikTok? You know, like I, I, I like this is all stuff that's kind of beyond me. Like my wife, she's way more tuned into it. She's like, you need to get a TikTok. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and she was all like, yeah, you're too old and, and everything. And, uh, but I mean, I, I see what she means because things change so fast. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you, know, the, you know, like the days of the tooth and nail compilations and, you know, fat records compilations and all this stuff that get handed out at Warp Tour, those days are past where the label you're on means something. Now it's really just how much coverage can you make? Like how many eyes can you get? And, uh, and then while also being, you know, in their site, do they find value in you? Like, that's what's so hard about, like, there's so many good bands that I see that are unsigned, but just because they're unsigned, people write them off because everybody has this status of, like, well, you're not on a label, so so then you can't be that serious. And I think it's unfortunate, whereas, you know, I've always told people back in the day, like, I don't even think a Skylar Drive would have made it back in, like, the 80s metal days with, like, Guns N' Roses and Motley Crue. Like, I was like, those guys hit the streets and, like, worked their asses off. And I was like, that's what it took. And, like, those were the days where, like, the best of the best made it. And, uh, and I, and I, th- I think it's sad that it's not that way anymore, that now it's really who can use a program the best, who has the coolest friends. Mm-hmm. Could we expect, uh, maybe a small signals tour of any time in 2022 if hypothetically COVID just disappears? <laughs> I mean, it'd be really nice to be able to do something. I mean, I mean, John and I have talked about it a lot and it's something we want to do. I mean, him and I, of course, are in a different position where we're not a full band so we would need to find you know people to perform with i mean it's on our minds but unfortunately just because of you know things get better things don't get better and it almost seems like there's no light at the end i mean like we want to we 100 percent want to i wouldn't say like full tours a little, little I mean, mini I run a little mini run or something yeah, like that's probably the most of what like we would end up doing is like, hey, you know, like you do like a weekend in California or, you know, a weekend here, you know, you do like a few, you know, solid shows here. Uh, but no, I mean, not like what it was. I mean, him and I, you know, have, have an agreement and an understanding. It's like, I mean, we're not going to go hopping in a van anymore. You know, I'm 36 years old, got, you know, I'm married, I got two kids and everything. So I was like, I'm not hopping in a van really. But um but I'm still just as passionate. I mean, it's one of those things that, you know, anything else I can do to, uh, you know, get the word out and everything, I'm I'm all game for. I've always been up for putting the work in. Cool. I'm just going to leave you with two more if that's okay. Uh, let's do some fun ones, though. When you're when you're flipping through Netflix, what is your binge watching show? What is what are you addicted to when you when you watch shows like what shows in particular? So I would kind of answer that with a question. Are you married? I am. You are. So is it what you're binge watching or what she's been watch- binge watching? Well, she watches the show called Rain, and I don't really like it. It's like a colonial show. I'm all about like Stranger Things and Dexter and stuff like that. But uh, we have our middle ground. So let's say, what say, what what do you watch that you can sometimes get her to watch, and vice versa? Well, I mean, we we both definitely like Stranger Things. Uh, we've we've slacked on Dexter. Um, trying to think of other ones. Um, Have you seen Squid Game? We did. We did. At first, we didn't realize that there was a dub version. We started watching it on subtitles and only made it about three minutes. And I was like, oh fuck this. Um, <laughs> And then, and then we finally found out that it had the dubbed over version. It was like, oh, thank, thank Lord, because you know you got kids coming out every few minutes and everything, and all kinds of distractions. I was like, I don't have time to read all this. Um, but uh, but yeah, like we both liked it a lot. I mean, we're we're definitely looking forward to it. I mean, I guess one show uh, I really like The Witcher. Uh, I I enjoyed that quite a bit. Um, uh, have you watched um, Succession on HBO? I have not. I'm not it's even really familiar cool. with what it is actually. It's have good. you have you ever seen Meet Joe Black? Yes. Okay. With uh with Brad Pitt? Yeah, so then Mac might be able to make the same connection. So it's this uh it's this kind of uh 
mogul, this guy who has ownership of a quadrant of media in New York City. Um, and his whole family, not all of them work under him, but they all kind of have to suckle because he's the, he's, you know, he's the hive. And uh, so they're all kind of trying to find their way to, to navigate being under him while there's, you know, somebody else, uh, you know, a sibling who's trying to take it over. Um, so it's, it's this family drama. It's kind of dark comedy. But the connection I make to Meet Joe Black is the, um, the main girl's fiancé, Mac. Um, how he's trying to kind of take it over from him. And then you've got the goofy son-in-law who's really likable and everything. And then he's kind of like, uh, I'm trying to remember his, his name. Yeah, I'm sure you know which character I'm talking about. But there yeah, are a lot of connections. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but there are a lot of connections that I made to Succession with Meet Joe Black, which I always love Meet Joe Black. But uh, yeah, but yeah, if you haven't seen Succession, it's a great show. I think it, I think it just made it through its third season on HBO. I will look it up. The last question yeah, I have for you, sir, and I appreciate you so much for doing this, is I would like to know your happiest tour moment when you were touring with the Skylet, no matter what country it was, is there one particular moment where you just smiled more than any other time and you just laughed and it's just a, a really happy memory? Um, man. I feel like a really special one was probably on stage in Chile. In Chile? And I feel like some of the other, I feel like some of the other guys probably probably would would have said the same. I'm pretty sure it was it was chilly. It was on it was on um let me quickly let me see let me see if I can find it here. I've got I've got my phone cuz so we went uh we were with Alisana and I remember it was just this huge this huge culture shock to us. Um let me quickly see if I can find it here. I'm done, I'm on Google right now. <laughs> Yeah, we did a few. Um, but what what made what made that particular show so special, though? I mean, I don't think that we've ever been in a situation where, like, you know, like a fan base is just so grateful to have you there. I mean, like, sure, like there were places that had like good fan bases, and um, and uh, you know, like great crowd reactions. But the kind of appreciation in these, you know, like South American or I mean, Southeast Asia, like, you know, like all the Philippines shows and Indonesia, those are right there on par with that. So I wouldn't leave them out of that at all. Uh, it's just the first one that came to mind. Um, it's just this whole different appreciation of, you know, of being there and performing and, and the passion that you feel from them is just completely different. Um, you know, and I hope that doesn't downplay anything in the States or Canada or the UK or Europe or anything, because those are all great, too. But it's just a completely different sense of appreciation of what we're doing in, I'd say, specifically like South America and, and Southeast Asia. Oh, yeah. I've heard I've interviewed other people who said the same thing, like they've gone to Japan and then the Japanese people don't know any of the words or little to no words, but they know every word to your song and they're just maximum jumping up and down, crowd surfing. It's just a different response, even though you get a great response from, from the States and Canada, like you mentioned. But for some reason, some other countries just appreciate certain music more. And it sounds like in Chile, they showed you a hell of a good time, bro. <laughs> hell yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. It was always awesome. I mean, like those tours were always definitely the, you know, like the most, I don't know, I guess the most like special. I mean, like there's there's tons of shows in the States that I can think of that were, you know, kind of those like magical moments where you, you'll just always remember them because because of, of the connection because oddly it's not like everybody over there knew all the words or anything like I can think of tons of shows in the states where like you could just completely shut off everything and they and it was like wow like there's so much going on here they all know exactly the words but it was just a different yeah it was just a different passion over there of uh you know it was just extreme I guess <laughs> that's awesome well Jack thank you so much for doing this Shout out to your bulldog who was in the episode the whole time, but uh, that's awesome. He made a little cameo. We appreciate you uh, just speaking your mind and, and letting us know the truth behind everything. We hope Signals is a huge success. If you come to California, especially anywhere in the Los Angeles, Anaheim area, please let me know so I can bring a bunch of people and support you. And uh, happy New Year's to you, sir. Yeah, thank you. And the same to you guys. Thanks for... 
thanks for having me on. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll see you guys at some point in person. Hell yeah, this is fun. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Jagman. Hell yeah. Give me a hell Thank yeah. you, sir. <laughs> That was amazing. That was amazing. <laughs> What'd you think, dude? I like him. I think we got all the juice, all the details. Um, really, really cool dude. Down to earth, he had some really great advice for, for some of the bands. Um, some good questions came in from uh, our, our side, I thought, from, from you guys in chat. And I didn't. I had no idea that he possibly could have joined Versa Emerge or hit the lights. That was kind of a an eye opener. Uh, I could. I, I could imagine him being in Versa Emerge too, because if you've ever heard their first first EP, there was a slightly high pitched singer before. They